The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, final letters from the victims of the Holocaust. That was written by a child. She was almost 12 years old. And the museum that's keeping their memories alive. The Nazis not only planned to murder the Jews, but also to erase who were they and what happened to them. And then, the author whose novels have sold more than 200 million copies. Now, she's writing cookbooks. Debbie Maycumber steps into our kitchen on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. I want to talk to you today before we get into this program about what seems to be happening in the Washington area that alarms me terrifically. The FBI, the Justice Department, is supposed to serve at the pleasure of the President of the United States. He is their boss. But what's happening is the Justice Department and the FBI are out to kill the President. They're not to kill him literally, but to take away his power and to get him impeached in some fashion. And what's happening, this man who is the acting attorney general, deputy uh, Rosenstein, is in league with a former FBI director whose name's Comey and a uh, former FBI director whose name is Mueller, who is the uh, special prosecutor. And Comey has written a letter which allows Mueller to expand his uh, uh, inquiries way beyond Russian collusion. And what's happened is they have gone out to uh, one of the districts of the uh, Justice Department in Manhattan and gotten a uh, U.S. attorney to go after a lawyer who represented Trump and seized his private papers, seized his attorney-client uh, privileged materials, and then is giving them over to other FBI agents who in turn can give certain things available to the special prosecutor. Now, that has nothing to do with Russia, but it's, it's being set up. And the whole idea is these men, and the FBI particularly, have determined they don't like Trump as president and they want to destroy him. And there's a, I mean, talk about collusion. It is the worst possible kind. And they are violating the norms of our government, and they're, they're, they're moving beyond anything that's reasonable. Now, how did this come about? Well, the attorney general, somewhere along the way, he was talking to some Russian. And because he was talking to some Russian, uh, he therefore recused himself from all these inquiries and left the Justice Department in the hands of Rosenstein. And Rosenstein apparently is in league with the FBI. But the FBI has stonewalled a congressional uh, inquiry. They have, and the Justice Department, they said, we want these papers. And they said, well, maybe it'll take two or three years to get the material for you. I mean, this is insane. But they are stonewalling Congress, and they're acting as if they are above the law. But they say, you know, we're the law. And Comey is saying that Trump is like a crime boss. Really? It's horrible. Well, ladies and gentlemen, something's got to be done. So one thing I would ask you to do is to pray for the president, because the, this thing has is, is gotten out of control. We elected Donald Trump as our president. He is doing a superb job. 51% of the American people think he's doing a good job. They're pleased with him. They're, they, he's gotten it through uh, all kinds of initiatives that are good for us. And we don't need a bunch of gumshoes from the Justice Department trying to destroy him. And this is what's happening, and it's got to stop. So I would, if nothing else, I'd call on you to pray for God himself to intervene in this thing, because I cannot imagine that uh, an agency of government which reports to the president would now turn against the president and try to destroy him. This is, is strange. In any corporation, you say, this is insanity. You allow a vice president to, to destroy the president of the institution without any uh, recourse at all. Well, there's got to be some recourse. 
And you, the American people, need to do something about it. I mean, complain, do everything you can. But the Justice Department right now is out of control. The FBI is out of control. And they are destroying their credibility with the American people. And I just think it's a, it's a terrible shame. Well, I, I think it doesn't bode well for the future either. Well, not if you can run into an attorney's office, seize his papers, especially things dealing with attorney-client privilege, and then they want to extend, expand it now to find out Trump's dealing with uh, some film man when they were having a conversation about the women, you know. I mean, this thing has nothing to do with Russians, but it's, it's happening. And ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it just appalls me. So A, pray. B, let your voice be heard. Okay. We'll get rid of for a tougher American foreign policy on Russia, Iran, and other countries. President Trump's choice for his new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, is going to his confirmation hearings today. And he says, the U.S. has a duty to lead. He is a great guy and a wonderful choice for Secretary of State. Terry? Well, Pompeo developed a close relationship with the president when he was the CIA director. And the two men agree that the United States has to stand firm against some of the biggest challenges in the world. Heather Sells has the story. Oh. Pompeo is making it clear the U.S. will be taking a strong stand against Russia. As he faces questions over the Iran nuclear deal, North Korea and Syria, Pompeo will also let senators know that he'll strengthen the State Department and reassert its role as a major player in U.S. national security. It's a big contrast with his predecessor, Rex Tillerson, who approved massive budget cuts at state and left scores of top positions empty. He will also leave no doubt about his tough stance on some of the most challenging relationships the U.S. has. Pompeo will tell senators that years of a soft U.S. policy towards Russia are over. Just days after a suspect chemical attack in Syria, he'll speak on military action there and chastise Syria's ally, Russia, calling it a danger to our country. But at the same time, he'll also emphasize that diplomacy with Moscow must continue. His take on foreign affairs closely aligns with the administration. Russia holds some responsibility in the fact that they guaranteed that Syria wouldn't use chemical weapons again, and they did. And just this morning, the president tweeted again about a U.S. military response to that chemical weapons assault, saying an attack on Syria could take place very soon or not so soon at all. That's Pompeo dangerous. is close uh, with dangerous. the president, who has asked to get his intelligence briefings personally from Pompeo several times a week. Pompeo is expected to bolster the president on the subject of North Korea, telling senators the president isn't one to play games at the negotiating table. Democratic senators on the Foreign Relations Committee have clearly signaled their concerns with Pompeo. Some of the positions he's taken in the past, uh, I think, would be challenging in the world to try to explain. It's not at all clear that Pompeo has the votes he needs to make it out of the Foreign Relations Committee. Most Democrats have already said they will not support Pompeo, and Republican Senator Rand Paul has also said he's a no. But Pompeo could still be approved by the full Senate, making him likely to be the next Secretary of State. Heather Sells, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. Mike Pompeo is a fantastic guy, fantastic pick, wonderful man, and uh, you couldn't be represented by anybody any better. And so the Democrats oppose him. Shame on them, and I think the American people will hold them responsible if they, uh, they are elections coming up, and they're, they're going, are going to have to be accountable. But if, if, if the Senate doesn't confirm him, there's something seriously wrong with our processes. Well, in other news, Republicans in the House of Representatives will have a new leader next year after the retirement of Speaker Paul Ryan, who's, again, been a tremendous voice in that body. John Jessup has this. That's right, Pat. Ryan announced yesterday he won't be running for re-election in the House of Representatives. And as Abigail Robertson reports, even as congressional Republicans say goodbye, they're looking ahead to see who might take his place. 
After 20 years, Speaker Ryan surprised the political world with his decision to leave Washington in January. In the end, the main reason for his departure came down to his wife and three teenage kids. What I realize is, if I am here for one more term, my kids will only have ever known me as a weekend dad. Uh, I just can't let that happen. Ryan, who lost his dad when he was 16, told CBN News earlier this year he calls his kids each night he's away to pray with them before they go to bed. I could not do my job as a, as a husband, as a father, as Speaker of the House without my faith. It is, it is indispensable. It's, it was, it's an integral part of my life. I start my day in prayer. I end my day in prayer. Ryan reluctantly became Speaker in 2015 after colleagues convinced him he could unite the party and move their legislative agenda forward. Looking back, Ryan's glad he's accepted the responsibility and sees tax reform and rebuilding the military as his biggest achievements. I am proud of what this conference has achieved, and I believe its future is bright. Still, many colleagues on the Hill will find it hard to say goodbye. He's going to be missed. He's a great leader, uh, but he's going to work hard until, you know, until the very, very end. Now Republicans face challenging midterm elections, uncertain if they'll hold the majority. But Congressman Robert Pittenger tells CBN News he feels good about Ryan's potential replacements. Well, we have some good folks out there in our leadership. Uh, just had Kevin McCarthy in my district uh, yesterday. He is remarkable. Steve Scalise is remarkable. Patrick McHenry, my colleague from North Carolina. These are great folks. Uh, we're in good hands. Speaker Ryan says he plans to finish strong in Washington and that he will not leave until his current term has ended. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. Well, the worst may finally be over for the stock market after weeks of wild swings, with the Dow Jones Industrials often moving between four and 600 points in a single day. Some analysts believe the market has made it through the worst of a serious correction and say stocks could still move sideways for a while, adding that the market will, over time, move higher. As for the overall economy, it could be weak in the first quarter, but still hit the Trump administration's target of 3% growth for the year. Pat? Well, all the economic indicators are very positive. The manufacturing index is up and the wages are strong. The labor market is tight. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a good thing for workers. You know, so uh, it looks like the market is stabilized for the time being. And uh, I, I still would keep a little powder uh, it, just in case, because I don't think uh, with the, the huge deficits we're facing and uh, the enormous problems with a war with China, North Korea, Russia, it, Syria, et cetera, uh, we could be in trouble. I might add that, you know, oil has hit a, a new high the, in the last 20, uh, you know, few years. Uh, it's up to $66 a barrel or more and going a looks, looks like higher. So from way down in the 30s and up to 66, I mean, that's like double what it was. And uh, so people are in the oil business are probably very happy at what's happening. But what that does to the economy, because oil affects everything that we use and buy. Uh, so in terms of inflation, that could be inflationary. Does that mean the Fed will come along and turn the screws, and if they hit the button too hard, that can affect stocks. So in any event, uh, I, I think a little, a little caution is in, in, in order, but I do think the market looks like now is stabilized and is going up, and for that, those who have stocks, those of us who have stocks are very happy. John. Matt, Jews in Europe are facing anti-Semitism at a higher level at any time since the days of World War II and the Holocaust. That's the conclusion from a report by the European Jewish Congress. The group's president told Quartz Online that anti-Semitism is becoming more normalized in Europe, adding that in many parts of the continent, Jewish communities and institutions can only operate under strict security measures and that fences, surveillance and police and military protection have become part of their daily lives. Pat, this is a troubling finding that we've been reporting on for quite some time. Uh, you know, when I went over to Eastern Europe years and years ago, in Romania and Poland, places like that, I found vicious, virulent anti-Semitism in countries where maybe at max they had 3,000, 4,000 Jews. 
and yet there was this terrible anti-Semitism. And that's been simmering, and now, of course, with the Arabs and the United Nations solidly against Israel, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very troubling thing. And I, I think for those of us who uh, care so deeply about the future of Israel and the Jewish people, I think this is very troubling. But the Bible talks about the fact that the nations of the earth one day will come against Israel. You read Zechariah and others, the whole nations will come against Jerusalem. And, uh, well, we can see what that resulted in when what was called the Holocaust. And Scott Ross has a very interesting piece about, well, some interesting things, a rare look at uh, the, the letters written by victims. Scott? A child. She was almost 12 years old. The child was shot. The rest of the family survived. And her brother, uh, now 84 years old, donated the letter to Yad Vashem. Oh. Well, today on Holocaust Remembrance Day, we're going to explore this new exhibit at Yad Vashem in Israel after this. Every year, Israelis pause to remember a time in history that is called the Holocaust, the slaughter of six million Jews by the Nazis and their collaborators. It can be hard to understand that each one of these six million people was an individual with his or her own life, family, hopes, and dreams. But now a new online exhibit from Israel's Holocaust Museum Tell some of those stories that tear your heart to read and hear about it. Scott Ross brings us this report from Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. My dear Rosie, I am happy that you received our greetings. What are you up to, my darling? Be well. Many kisses from your mother. The call Mechtav. In every letter at the beginning and at the end, she wrote, make sure to take care of your health. That's the final letter Rosie Yoshkovitz received from her mother, Berta. Each story is unique. In those online exhibitions, we are telling stories first to commemorate the victims, to give them back their names, human dignity. Yona Kobo oversees the new exhibit Last Letters from the Holocaust, 1943. The letters were chosen because they are very intimate, very personal, very unique, because each handwriting is different from one person to the other. You can find stains of tears of those who wrote the letters and tears of those who received the letter. When you read these letters from mothers, fathers, children, uh, what does that do to your heart? Sometimes it's tearing me apart. Sometimes I'm crying. How were they delivered? Was there a post? There was no postal service. In the that. post service worked the entire war, even in the camps. Censorship. Sometimes not. But I think they censored themselves. Kobo gave us an extremely rare look at Yad Vashem's vast archives, where I saw some of the actual letters. What does this say? That was written by a child. She was almost 12 years old. Her name was Regina Folkenflik, and she was living at East Poland. She was hidden at a Christian family. Her parents thought that was the best way to save her, by putting her in a good family. But the child was shot. The rest of the family survived. And her brother, uh, now 84 years old, donated the letter to Yad Vashem. It's in Polish, and she's writing, Dear mother and father and dear Dolik, her brother, be well. Mommy, don't be upset. Please forgive me, Mommy, for writing so little. And here's another one. That is another one, written by a young woman, 19 years old, Rosette Bomblat. She was active in a group of underground movement in Paris. She helped saving other Jewish children. Her family was hidden in a village not far away from Paris. And Rosette is writing here in French. I'm only living for the day that we will be together again. All the family, except of Rosette and her oldest sister Sarah, survived and emigrated to Israel. 
she didn't. She didn't. She was transferred to Auschwitz. She was murdered in the camp. What about your family? My mother was born in Germany, mm -hmm. and she has been through a ghetto, a labor camp, and a very, very long death march. She marched 800 kilometers by foot. My father survived Auschwitz, and they met after the war was over. And when I was older, like 35 years old, my father remembered to tell me his secret. He was a widow when he met my mom. He lost his first wife and baby daughter in Belzitz. I just recently found the name of his daughter. This online exhibit is just one of many at Yad Vashem, the main collection of Holocaust documentation in the world. So one of the main missions of Yad Vashem is to collect into one place all the documents, all the evidence about the fate of Jews during the Holocaust. It was the first intention of Holocaust survivors the first day after the war was ended. Dr. Heim Gertner is director of the archives. We understood that the Nazis not only planned to murder the Jews, but also understood or wanted to annihilate, to erase our ability to know who were they and what happened to them. Erase their memory. So this is why Yad Vashem decided as one of its uh, most important uh, missions to collect all those pieces of huge puzzle of uh, our uh, joint history into one place. The more than 200 million pages of documentation includes testimony, survivor's stories, photos, and other personal items. We launched seven years ago a national campaign. We call it Gathering the Fragments. We met until now close to 11,000 people who donated to us during the last seven years more than 124,000 items and collections. And are there many survivors living today that have seen this, been here, and, and experienced this? Yes, uh, Holocaust survivors do see Yad Vashem as the home of their items, and they say here it will be kept forever. Here mm. Preserve it. And I may tell you the story, for example, of this uh, sweater over here yes. that was donated to us on the first day of this campaign seven years ago by a lady from Tel Aviv. Uh, it was belonged to her sister. So uh, for her, it took a lot of time to decide to uh, separate with that. The name Yad Vashem comes from the Bible. It means a memorial and a name. Yad Vashem during the last uh, two decades and more is struggling to tell the story of individuals in the Holocaust. They were human beings that used to live in Europe and elsewhere and they had lives, they had kids, they had dreams and it tells us also something about their ability to uh, survive during those years in those inability times. How important is it to have all this online? Around a million visitors are coming to Yad Vashem every year. Almost 10,000 of them are visiting our reading room every year. But last year, more than 19 million people all over the world, Jews and non-Jews, used our databases online. Because you're around us and have explored this and researched it, do you become jaded at all? I mean, it has to affect your heart. I am a son of a Holocaust survivor myself. I ask you that. I think that as an educator, our mission here to educate the next generation is what gives us the strength to think ahead what to do with that story for generations to come. Scott Ross for CBN at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. You know, I join with people who say never again. We can't let something like that ever happen again. But nevertheless, this anti-Semitism that's coming about, the, uh, well, the Muslims, uh, the extreme jihadists, I can use that term, uh, have not hesitated to eradicate people. ISIS was that way. Uh, what they, they did in certain areas was just appalling. We, we can't let that happen as a nation, as a world. We can't let ever something as devastating as this ever happen again. And Adolf Hitler and the Nazis they were demonized. I have no question that the devil was involved. And these people, they believed, I think, sincerely that what they were doing was somehow their, their destiny and then they to kill the Jews. We can't let that happen. We can't let this demonic spirit permeate this world we live in. We've got to say, you know, the, the Jews say lahaim, which means to life. We've got to always say to life, not to death. Terry.
Speaking up to life, the Bible says that through Israel, the entire world will be blessed. Well, all next week on the 700 Club, you're going to see this prophecy come to life in our new CBN documentary called To Life, How Israeli Volunteers Are Changing the World. This exclusive series shows Israelis helping people all over the globe. So join us next Monday, that's April 16th, on the 700 Club, and then all next week for to life. You don't want to miss it. It's a powerful, powerful film. Well, up next, your questions, some honest answers. Sheila says, why do we always close prayer with in Jesus' name? Stay tuned for Pat's answer. It's coming up after this. CBN Superbook is changing the lives of children all over the world. And we'd love for you to be a part of that. When you join the Superbook DVD Club, you're going to receive three copies of the newest episode of Superbook for your recurring gift of $25 on a credit or debit card. And then every four weeks, you'll receive a new Superbook episode and your account will be automatically debited $25. When you join today, we're going to send you three copies of our latest episode, Explorer 14. You'll receive two Superbook DVD stories, Samuel uh, and the Call of God and Peter's Denial plus Bible background videos, music videos, and a drawing lesson. All you have to do is call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com to join that way. DVD Club members can stream all episodes of Season 1 and 2 for free. These are wonderful for your children, your grandchildren, your neighborhood, uh, maybe even your school. So we want to encourage you to be a part of that. Okay, you ready for some honest answers right, to some tough it, questions? Let's, let's do it. Okay, right. this is Sheila, who wants to know, why do we always close prayer with, in Jesus' name? Well, uh, we come to the Father in Jesus' name, and it, it's like a power of attorney. You know, you sign with the, you know, authority of somebody else. That, and it's because of Jesus that we can approach the Father. And therefore, we say to the Father, uh, I am standing uh, in the role of the attorney, the power of attorney that's been given me, and that's Jesus. And because of him, I can come to your throne. And that's why we say in Jesus' name. Well, and he said that, didn't he? He told us. Whatever you whatever ask you in my ask. name, that will be, mm -hmm. of course, that's, that's, that's biblical. Yeah. Okay, this is Darla who says, I was raised a Lutheran, and I've always believed in God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. I've never wavered from that, but I did from the church when I was younger. God has done so many things in my life to keep me safe. I'm now retired and want to find a church and find my gifts that God has given us all. I heard a pastor say, if you don't know your gifts, the Holy Spirit isn't in you. Is that true? No, of course not. Uh, you know, we, we learn things as we get older in the Lord. We learn things as we live. Uh, but if you don't know a gift, the Holy Spirit isn't in you. That's nonsense. All right. And this is Michael who says, are archangels God's messengers practicing here on earth now? Well, I, I don't see anything in the Bible that says they stopped. Uh, you know, uh, Michael, uh, Raphael, some of these are archangels, and uh, they're powerful beings, you know. Uh, you read Daniel, he talked about the prince of Persia, mm -hmm. and one came to give him a message, and the prince of Persia withstood me. I think they're, they're angels leading uh, over each nation, and they're certainly demons that, that have territory. So uh, are they... Active, as far as I know, there's nothing in the Bible that says they're not, and that, that's all I can tell you. Okay, this is Nathaniel Pat who says, I have confessed with my mouth Jesus is my Lord and Savior and the Son of God, and I believe he rose again on the third day. I ask for forgiveness all the time when the Holy Spirit convicts me of something I've done wrong. Would I go to hell if I sinned and died, let's say, in a car wreck before I had time to repent? This tears me apart mentally. Please help. You know... People, I don't know whether it's Catholic teaching or some church teaching or what, what's wrong, but there are people that carry these strange guilts with them. Look, the Bible says when you come to the Lord, you are adopted into the family of God, and you are his child from that moment on. What would you think if you adopted a little child and you said, now listen, son, you're a nice little boy, and uh, we've adopted you, but if you spill your milk, I'm going to kick you out of the house. 
What kind of thing would that be? Well, of course you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that in a human context, and neither does God. If you are adopted into the family of God, you're in the family, and he wants you to rest in him and enjoy him and, and, and know the forgiveness that comes about from knowing him. That, that's, so don't be tormented with the fact, well, what if I, I've you know, thought a bad thought, and then I get in a car wreck, and I'm going to hell? No way. You know, you are in the family of God, and the forgiveness of God is from everlasting unto everlasting. All right? This is a viewer who says, one question that has perplexed me all of my Christian life is this. The Bible says that a repentant sinner is baptized and all their sins are forgiven. However, the Bible also says that when Christ opens the Lamb's Book of Life, that each person will have to give an account for his life and presumably all those, quote, forgotten sins. Which one is it? Uh, you've added the presumably stuff. <laughs> That's yours. Presumably is yours. That didn't come from the Lord. It didn't come from the Bible. You said, presumably, uh, it's yours. Uh, look, I do believe that the so-called Bema is the judgment seat of Christ, and we will account for the life we lived. And hopefully, somebody's spent uh, 40, 50 years serving the Lord and done many wonderful things. You'd like to think in heaven that that's remembered. And the Bible says there will be rewards in heaven, and you won't lose your reward. So I, I do believe there's a reward, and it also says that those who knew the Lord's will and didn't do it, he'll be, uh, you know, punished with a number of stripes. So I, I, I think there's going to be an accounting, but the, the answer is once, you know, well, John says it very clearly. Uh, he that hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. You're not going to the great white throne judgment. You're not going to heaven or hell. Uh, but there are, I do think, clearly rewards for the way you've lived in this life. You, you can't just live, you know, a, a life of uh, self-indulgence and think that you're going to get the same deal as somebody who's been serving God all his life. So. That's what the Bible teaches, you know, all right? Yeah, this is David and Diane. They say, our church teaches that when you're baptized, it should be done by full immersion. We are 80 and do not feel the need to be <laughs> baptized again. Twelve years ago, we were baptized in another church by sprinkling. According to the Bible, is it necessary to be baptized again by full immersion? I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think the method of baptism, some have pouring, they pour something over here, some sprinkle a little bit. I'm a Baptist, and it was full immersion. And uh, I, I baptize people. It's the whole deal. I baptize people in the Jordan River. On Christmas Day, a few years ago, we had a group, and I baptized 59 people in the Jordan River, all of them by immersion. I believe that. <laughs> but do you have to re-baptize? Re I think the big thing is, did you get baptized as a believer? And you know, if, if you're not a believer, uh, I think it doesn't hurt necessarily to, to get it done again. But I think uh, that's a sign of the covenant between you. I'm, I'm dead in Christ. I'm raised in newness of life. The, that's, the baptism is, is a sign in the sense that you have come to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul said, I didn't baptize, but a few people. You know, if, if baptism was salvation, then Paul would have baptized everybody. He preached the gospel to everybody, but he didn't baptize everybody. You read what the Bible says. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. And thank, thank you, thank you very much. for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, still ahead, the popular novelist who has a new cookbook. We invite you to pull up a chair at Debbie Maycomber's table later on today's 700 Club. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The Alabama Crimson Tide football team celebrated their national championship this week with a trip to the White House. But the visit turned into a ministry opportunity. Soon after the president spoke, a group of players approached the president, and after exchanging a few words, they began to pray for him. The president bowed his head while a player placed his hand on the president's shoulder, and they prayed. Trump ended his remarks by saying, roll tide. 
Well, he's the world's oldest man. Masa Zonanaka of Japan is 112 years old. He was born in July of 1905. He says he enjoys soaking in northern Japan's hot springs, likes eating sweets, especially cakes, as he's doing right there. He still reads the newspaper after breakfast every morning and enjoys sumo wrestling and samurai dramas on television. The oldest person in the world is a Japanese woman. She's 117 years old. So hopefully this story makes everyone feel pretty young. And you can always get the latest from CBN News by visiting our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Peggy Belden's blueberry muffins, Joe Marie's peanut butter cookies. If you're a fan of best-selling novelist Debbie Maycumber, you're familiar with how she brings her characters to life through the foods they love. Take a look. New York Times best-selling author Debbie Maycumber has become one of today's most popular writers. With over 200 million books in print worldwide, nine of them have been turned into made-for-TV movies or television series, like Cedar Cove starring Andy McDowell. Now, Debbie invites us to dinner. In her latest cookbook, Debbie May Cumber's Table, she shares recipes inspired by her beloved novels and savory dishes that she makes with her own family. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Debbie Maycumber. It's great okay. to have you back here. Oh, thanks, Terry. Well, your books, you've sold, what is it, over 200 million or something like that? <laughs> Some crazy number like that. Why a cookbook? What made you decide to do this now? Well, I think food is just so much more than nourishment. It's heritage, it's family. It's my way of opening up my kitchen, my family, my life to my readers. That's awesome. And your mom was really the one who initiated this in your own life, right? Oh, my mom was a fabulous cook. She was tiny. She was only 4'11". She barely weighed 100 pounds, wow. but she could cook. And mom and I talked every single day and always talked about, what are you serving for dinner? Have you tried this <laughs> recipe? When we did Thanksgiving, it would take us weeks to decide on the side dishes. And now you're doing that with the girls in your family. Yes, it's one generation to the next. I'm cooking with the grandkids, cooking with my daughters. You know, the tradition of all of that, I think, is special in all of our homes at the holidays, especially. I think we hear about that. But let's talk about some of the recipes that we have in front of us, because okay. you say that this is the perfect potluck. <laughs> It is a perfect potluck. Right? Yeah. Let's start down here because you've, did you make your own hummus in this? I end? do. Hummus is really easy to make. You just take a couple of cans of garbanzo beans hummus. and tahini and you can, you know, this is red uh, pepper hummus uh -huh. here. And, but there are several variations that I have in the cookbook for it. Uh, jalapeno hummus and others. Oh, somebody who likes a little kick, right? Yeah. <laughs> and this is honey and mm. garlic chicken thighs that are in the slow roasted in a cooker. You could do it in the oven, too, with a, a soy sauce Well, base. you know what's so great about that is that it's so inexpensive to buy chicken thighs. So when you buy, find a recipe that's a really good and one for it, that's awesome. Good. Good for a family. And this, what have you got up here? This is artichoke and spinach lasagna. Now, anything with bacon cheese in it. <laughs> so you kind of balance out. You know, people may say, oh, I don't want to eat spinach, but you will here. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Oh, the flavor of all of that, yeah. I'm sure, is wonderful. And then you have a salad here that is it looks like a Caesar salad but with kale with kale which is That's good right. for us right you know if you put the right dressing on it <laughs> you can eat kale it it's anything. not my favorite thing but I but I, I have to say you put that you put this fabulous dressing with just a little bit of anchovies mm -hmm. in it it's really good it's and it's so good for you but today we're actually going to show people what yeah. you have here this is a lasagna but not done the it's a casserole. A casserole, not yeah. done the typical way. It looks like a lasagna, but okay. So we've got all the components here and yeah. we've started this. Tell us how you do this and why this is layered, but not lasagna. It's your own version of. Yeah, it's it's a layered casserole. And so you take the the uh, tortillas uh -huh. and we're going to spread those around. Okay. And, uh, and, and you I started like with and putting and this here. on the bottom. Is there no, yes. you put this on the bottom yes. first, right? And then yes. the. The, the um, yeah the hamburger right mix which has corn and beans in it yeah just a hamburger mm -hmm. with the yes and it's got and I added a little jalapeno too so because I like spicy you, you kind of like that I don't wait <laughs> that's not stuff. supposed to hurt but I disagree <laughs> 
So once we've put this in, then do we start again? No, we're going to put that. We're going to put this on. Yeah, we're going to put okay. that on. And just okay. spread it all. Just kind of spread it around. Yeah, spread it around. And uh, cheese. And there's lots of cheese in this. It's a cup and a half for every layer. Wow. So that is uh, in that. And is it any particular kind of cheese? Are you using a mix? It looks like it's a. It's a Mexican okay. cheese mix. You can, you know, you get it shredded. You can buy it in the mm -hmm. grocery store. Okay, I'm going to oh, do good that. Good job, good job. Now let's do the cheese. And I can tell you like this, so we're just going <laughs> to. Yeah. We're just going to layer this on, on there, right? There, yeah. Well, I'm a Wisconsin girl, so this works for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the plug for the state, right? <laughs> this yeah. looks great. It, oh, it tastes really good. And when you add a little bit more of the sauce Now, here, what are you using for the sauce, Debbie? What it's just that? a canned enchilada sauce. Make oh, it okay. easy, you know. I'm not going to. I'm for easy. I'm for easy. And you just you drizzle that yeah, over I this? Yeah, just kind of drizzle that over it because you don't want too much of it. And then I see you have these yummy black olives. Oh, yeah, that kind of just adds. You're oh, just, it just kind of looks nice over the top, yeah, right? Yeah, it does. <laughs> this is great. But this is kind of a nice, fast meal for people. People are looking for this today when they get home from work, something that the whole family likes but is easy to throw together. Oh, yeah, and you can make it ahead and put it in the refrigerator and just toss it in the oven. So you so, can do this ahead. Awesome. Yeah, yeah and then okay. go ahead and put some tortillas on. So this is the finished, where you keep layering this till you yeah. get as high as you want to go in your right. dish. And then you bake it. You bake it for 375 for 30 minutes. Wow, only 30. That's great. And the whole thing comes out looking beautiful, and it cuts beautifully, as you can see. And you've added sour cream to that. and A, a little bit of cilantro. Little cilantro. I love cilantro. Okay, then we have to have dessert. Of course. Because, of because course. We have dessert. <laughs> so tell me what this is. It's a poke cake? It's Boston cream pie cake, poke cake. Well, okay. <laughs> so, and, and you, I, I give you the recipe for the cake, but if you want to use a white cake mix, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. And then you, you used cooked vanilla pudding. You want to cook because you want it nice and hot. Uh -huh. And you take a, a wooden spoon and poke the holes in it and then okay. spread the hot pudding over the top of the cake. And it seeps down into the seeps cake. Seeps down into the cake. And then you put it in the refrigerator. And then you take chocolate chips and, and with other yummy ingredients for the chocolate chips and melt that and put it on the top after it's all cool. And it's absolutely delicious. I know Pat wants this. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> well, <laughs> get that stuff. <laughs> it looks delicious. And this whole, you know, for, to have a gathering at your home, there's something for everybody That's here. That's right. And can I say there's something for everybody in Debbie's new cookbook. It's filled with dozens of mouth-watering recipes. It's called Debbie May Comer's Cumber's Table, and it's available wherever books are sold. We also have a social exclusive interview with Debbie on our Facebook page. If you'd like to watch that, go to facebook.com slash 700 club. And happy cooking to all of you, and thank you. You always entertain us. You've entertained Aww. us with your characters <laughs> and your stories, and now sharing some of the recipes from your own kitchen and from your mom too i'm sure yeah. in all of this so thank you debbie you're so welcome thank you great to have you back here well coming up an all-star center fielder charlie blackman home runs make the game go around but i think scoring a run when the other team thinks they're going to get out unscathed can really do a lot for your psyche and then get the momentum coming your way find out what's behind his signature beard after this All-star Charlie Blackman is coming off one of the best seasons ever for a leadoff hitter. And last week, the Colorados rewarded him, get this, a $108 million contract over six seasons. But what's most valuable of Charlie? Something that far exceeds the game he plays or what it pays, as our Tom Buring found out. Watch this. Come to Denver and you'll find a baseball swashbuckler. Rockies all-star center fielder Charlie Blackman rattles opponents with an elite bat, prize power, base running speed, and of course, that beard. On and off the field, the guy they call Chuck Nasty holds a great first impression. First man up as a leadoff hitter, you're the tone setter, tip of the spear. What is it about the role that you relish the most? 
I like being the first guy to go to the plate. Uh, I'm going to get the most at bats that night. Uh, I'm kind of the first representative of the Rockies out there. If I do well and get on base, we have a good chance to score because we have you know, such good players behind me. So I really enjoy being the catalyst of sorts. And as the playmaker, what one play as a hitter or fielder most energizes you? Well, I got to say home runs because the home runs make the make the game go around. Maybe the next best thing is a two out RBI because that's just such a big momentum shifter. You know, momentum is not something people talk about in baseball, but I think scoring a run when the other team thinks they're going to get out unscathed can really do a lot for your psyche and then get the momentum coming your way. And the beard, that's a tone setter, right? Right. And are you now convinced that the two of you are inseparable? I showed up at spring training in 2014 and made the team for the first time with my beard. And so I decided to stick with it. And uh, I was lucky enough to, to make the all-star team that year. So if it ain't broke, don't fix yeah, it. So I, I just kept it and uh, it's something that I enjoy. How have you learned to separate defeat from your self-worth? For me, spiritually, realizing that you know baseball is something that I spend a lot of time doing but you can't turn baseball into an idol. What you derive your self-worth from, it has to be something you do, not who you are. And once I figured all those things out, uh, honestly, baseball seemed a lot smaller to me. But with the ups and downs and the struggles of failure that are gonna happen inevitably within the game of baseball. We said you're the tone setter out there. Who and what is the tone setter for Charlie Blackman? You know, I ask for a grateful heart every day, and even when it seems tough, you, know, you should rejoice in being tested. Everything needs to be an opportunity in my eyes and not an obstacle. Charlie, what do you admire most about the Christ that you follow? The love that he has for me, even though I don't deserve it, you know, that grace is something that you know, I try to understand. You know, it's hard to comprehend. You know, I try and learn more about him every day, and I just want to represent our God in what I do on the field, how I treat people, and what I'm thinking all the time also. I think that's very important. Also important is Charlie's reputation as an independent thinker who values genuine Christian commitment. I think it's very important for a few reasons. Be honest with yourself. You've got to earnestly believe. And then if you believe it, then you have to, you know, you have to live it out, right? Like if you actually believe Jesus is who he says he is and that he died for our sins, then you can't just ignore that fact and go on doing whatever you feel like you're doing. You know, authenticity is going to show up. People are gonna find you out, you know, if you're just talking the talk and not walking the walk. How can we pray for you when we think of you and watch it? Good question. Every day I, I think humility is big. Like I need humility. And then I also need to stop thinking about myself so much. I need to be more concerned about other people, the people that I'm around, the people I interact with, even the people that I'm playing against. And um, so maybe just to, you know, that faith to step out and speak to someone or help someone who might need it. What a terrific guy. Well, we congratulate him. And boy, 108 million, that's not too shabby. <laughs> Hit a little ball with a bat. Absolutely, but hitting it well. <laughs> it's well. All right. what hey, you got? I've got an answer to prayer right. yeah, that you need to hear. This is Kim, who says, in 2009, I began having stomach pain, 24-hour-a-day pain. Went to 12 doctors, but no one could find anything wrong. A specialist, Dr. 13, told me he believed the lining of my stomach had been destroyed by the drinking I'd done in my life. He said I would have to live with it because medically there was no way to fix it. As I usually do, I was watching the 700 Club, and Pat said there's someone, the lining of your stomach has been ruined or destroyed. I thought, that's for me, maybe. It was, and I have no stomach pain anymore. I have no hope for resolving this problem through doctors or myself, but Jesus healed me. So thankful God works through CBN. Well, we wow. just a short period, and let's pray. Mm -hmm. The two of us will pray for you. Father, we pray for those in this audience. We thank you for this marvelous healing. We thank you for the miracle that you continuously do Day after day after day, thank you, Father. Now, Lord, for somebody, again, that's got a stomach problem, you've got mm -hmm. ulcers, God has just healed you right now in the name of you. You'll feel fire in your insides in Jesus' name. Terry? You know, I remember having this thing come the other day, and again, somebody who has skin sloughing off that is just... Uh, so painful. God is healing that for you. Lift up your hands and receive it for yourself today. Amen. Well, we leave you with this power minute from the Psalms. 
For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. Well, tomorrow, Grammy-winning sensation Mandisa tells us what rocked her faith and what brought her out of the dark. Great singer, wonderful time. Tune in to the 700 Club tomorrow as we continue exciting stories of God's blessing on people throughout our world. Well, that's all the time we've got for Terry and all of us. This is Pat Robertson. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.